Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, June the 14th, 2021. It is currently 9.50 a.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm here in the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church, located here in the middle of nowhere, Texas. We're outside right now. We have thunderstorms. I I, I started driving here, and then I turned around, went back home, and said, you know, I, I've got to get some things done. So then I got back in the car and said, I, I'm going there anywhere. So I, I'm going there anyway. So I have arrived here. There's still thunder, lightning in the area. I think the storm has kind of moved past us. But the only reason I tell you that is because, obviously, anytime I'm live on the air here in a church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, it does not take much for us to lose internet or power. I mean, it doesn't take much. So currently, the internet is working. Currently, the lights are on. So I'm going to use this opportunity, well, to to create a podcast episode, to do a live broadcast. But before we can do anything, before we can do anything this morning, We have some big announcements, some very big announcements, according to a scientific study. I don't know if you can hear the thunder outside. I'm I'm talking louder to 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 drown out the thunder. Yeah, it's it's yeah. There's some thunder going on outside. All right, but let's get back to this. According to a detailed, and I'm saying very detailed scientific study, I can now announce to you that the Theology Central podcast has now been certified a binge-worthy podcast. Yeah, I kind of messed that up, right? According to a scientific study, the Theology Central podcast has now been classified. It has now been deemed a binge-worthy podcast. Are, Are you excited about that? Now, the scientific study involved, well, just one person. Okay, all right, so... But they, but they called it binge worthy. So that, that's got to count for something, right? Let me read to you from an email that I received this morning uh, because, well, I, I was excited to, to hear this, right? And I thought I would make a big deal out of it, even if it's probably not that big a deal. But it's a scientific study because it's one email, all right? Here's what uh, I received. I'm not going to read everything. Um, here we go. Um, I have told, this is what it says. I have told, no, let me back this up. I just got my second vaccine. All right. Uh, A week ago and a friend I have been witnessing to is coming over in a week and we're going to binge listen to your podcast. Whoa, binge listen. So that means Theology Central is now binge worthy. Yeah. Okay. It's not that scientific, but it's it's encouraging to hear someone who they're going to bring a friend over and they're going to binge listen to my podcast. That's exciting. That's encouraging. Thank you so very much for saying that. Um, I, I, I mean, that's, that's just, that's awesome. Uh, they go on to say, I've told so many people about you and your podcast. If you need encouragement, then I'm here to give it to you. It's the least I can do for your, for your courage you've shown in being faithful to God's word during this incredible time of delusion in the church. I keep you and your families in, in your family, families. Yeah, I've got multiple families and your family in my prayers. So thank you so very much for that. That's, look, that you don't even understand. Again, I, I cannot express to people enough that I don't, forget me, forget me. Any podcast you listen to, please note that that podcaster when they're making that podcast, they're usually sitting in an empty room and they have no idea, you know, how people are responding. And when you tr- when you open your email and there's nothing there and you did like four live broadcasts, you don't know what to make of that. How do I interpret that? Okay, I did four live broadcasts yesterday and I received no emails. Does that Did that mean they liked it? Did that mean they hated it? Did it mean that I'm wasting my time? It's very hard to interpret that. So a, a quick email is always super appreciated. Thank you so very much. It is awesome to know that the, the Theology Central podcast is going to be binged listen to. Is that the correct word? Uh, This is a binge-worthy podcast. So thank you so very much for that. So that is awesome. So that is announcement number one. So now that we are now certified binge-worthy, we can do this. (laughs) 
Now, announcement number two. So announcement number one, we're binge worthy according to a scientific study, including one person. All right. So that's, yeah. Yay. Woohoo. Yeah, I know it's kind of pathetic, but that's okay. But that, that's awesome to hear. Number two, I know this is going to be shocking to many of you, but we finally reached, are you ready for this? 100 subscribers on YouTube. I know that it's impossible to believe. We, I think we made it to 100, then we dropped back down to 99, then we went back to 100. Uh, so so I, I usually tick someone off and then we drop a number. But right now, the last I look, I'm not going to look right now, but th- earlier this morning I looked and we were at 100 subscribers. If you listen to us via YouTube, thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate it. Again, YouTube is not... I mean, our emphasis is an audio podcast on all of the podcasting apps. YouTube is just kind of an extra. Uh, I, the, the numbers from YouTube don't even show up in the top 15 of all the different places people listen to us. But we're glad it's there so that people can find us. Let me just say that if you use YouTube for anything, if you have the YouTube app downloaded, please consider looking for us and subscribing and, you know, uh, giving thumbs up and positive comments and and maybe just make it a, a practice to try to listen as much as possible on YouTube just to try to make us more visible there so that maybe we can gain some more subscribers. More more than anything, just maybe that people will find us. That's that's the thing. Um there's there it's very hard to make your to get your podcast found and discovered, right? There's there's only there's only so much that that you can do right uh you a, a couple of things that can help you be discovered number 1 is obviously on apple podcast people writing reviews and giving us five star ratings you can't even imagine how big of help that is uh we have a pod page that helps us a little bit youtube just people listening and and thumbs ups i mean and and then mainly people sharing episodes and sharing the podcast with other people but from my perspective, there's very little that I can do. I can I can do what I can, but we are just I'm grateful we made it to a hundred. Look, I don't think we're ever going I don't think we'll ever get anywhere close to two hundred. But hey, we're there. We're 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 and we're we're grateful for that. So to everyone who subscribed on YouTube, thank you. Feel free to always email me anytime at newsif at yahoo.com. If you leave a comment on YouTube, I try my best to respond. If I've missed your comment, I apologize. I, I, I'm not. I'm not on YouTube that much. I, um, you know, if you look at my, I don't even have the YouTube app on my uh, mobile device. I have podcast app after podcast app after podcast app. I'm just not a YouTube person. I know people spend countless hours there, but that's great. If you're there and you take any time to listen to us, I I want you to understand we greatly appreciate it. I understand YouTube is for videos. Probably the first time you clicked on one of our programs, you were like, wait, what is this? There's no video? Well, this is stupid. And for some reason, you kept listening, and then you even hit the subscribe button. So thank you so very much for doing that. We greatly appreciate it. We don't know how long we'll be on YouTube because we already have two strikes against us. One more, we're banned. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully we can stay there as long as we possibly can. And uh, just remember, if you do listen to us on YouTube, you're not getting everything because there's some things I cannot upload to YouTube because if I get one more strike, we're gone. But we're, we're going to make the most of every uh, – we're going to be on every platform that we can be on. And so thank you for listening. So that, that's another uh, announcement. And uh, one other quick one. And I got to be careful how I say this. I am not saying this because I'm begging for money. I'm just telling you this just to offer clarification and just to save uh, time from people emailing me. At different times, I will get an email from someone saying, hey, greatly appreciate your program. We would like to financially support you. How can we do that? And uh, a lot of times I'm like, well, you you can send me a check. And some people are like, well, I don't even have a checkbook. I don't, you know, uh, I don't, is there another way? What, what, what's another way I can give? Well, we, we have a way that I never mention. I never, I never make announcements about it. I probably will do a little bit of announcing it maybe just so that people know so that they don't have to email me. If you go to, um, if you go to theologycentral.net, theologycentral.net, there's a drop down menu. It may be at the top there is a button for donate. And if you click on donate, you can donate. And basically you're donating via PayPal. 
and it goes directly into the church account, goes directly into the church account, does not come to my personal account. It goes to Victory Baptist Church. It goes into that account, and it and whatever you give goes to the, the church. Now, if you want it sp- specified for, hey, I'm giving this to the church, but I want it to be used only and solely for the internet ministry, then it will go to that. If you want it to be used for a book giveaway, I mean, you, you, can, you can specify. Just tell me how you want it to be used. Then I will we'll follow your directions to the, le- to the letter. I don't take any money from it. I, in other words, if, you, if it goes to the church, then that's not, that's not coming to me. All right. Now, we do have a listener who will send, uh, send a check and say you can use it for whatever you want, however you want. Sometimes uh, I think they've sent a check saying this is for you and Stacy, literally to, to me. I greatly appreciate that. Now, typically, I still take that money and try to do book giveaways and other things for the internet ministry. But um, I always appreciate whatever people, anytime people want to give, thank you. But please note, never going to charge you for anything, never going to put any ads on the podcast, never going to do any, not going to monetize it, not going to put it behind a paywall, not going to put special programs behind a paywall, not going to create a Patreon page, not going to do anything like that. If you want to support us, great, theologycentral.net, go to the donate tab. And the reason I'm bringing this up is it actually works. We didn't know if it even worked. I didn't even know if I had it set up correctly, but a listener I don't even know how many days ago, um, sent us an email saying, uh, how can I give? I told them this way, and they gave us, uh, I think, $160, which was greatly appreciated, and thank you so very much. But it's, it's available if you want to use it, but don't ever feel that it's necessary. Don't ever feel like you have to. I just want to make sure you know that it's there, all right? So a couple of announcements we had to get away. We're now binge-worthy. Hey, that's great. We have 100 subscribers on YouTube. That is great. And there is a donut donate tab. There's a donut tab. There's a donate tab on the Theology, Theology Central pod page. Again, you can find that by going to theologycentral.net. Please use the pod page. Please use it. Uh, you can share episodes from the pod page. You can tell people about the pod page. Um, it's just, it may, they, they can look up all the series. They can search. Uh, they're so, they can subscribe from there. The, the, use the pod page. It cost us, what, $15 a month. We have two pod pages, so both of them cost us $15 a month. That, I mean, that's a cost. We And we got no problem uh, paying for them if they're being utilized or if they're being utilized. So um, hopefully they are beneficial. All right. And uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm always trying to find different ways to use the pod pages for different things, but they're there. So theologycentral.net, very simple, donate tab if you want to use it. Now, we have a lot to do this morning. So let's get to it. All right. Let's get to, I know that was 13 minutes of announcements. I apologize, but they had to be made. All right. So here we go. The other day I did an episode in which I reported the following. A record percentage of Americans consider abortion morally acceptable in a new poll. A record percentage of Americans consider abortion morally acceptable in a new poll. Now, I took that article and I did the pretty similar thing with that article that I've done with other articles. And I tried to use this article to demonstrate that all of Christians' attempts to fight the culture war through political means, through boycotts, through all the different things Christians have tried to do, that it has failed over and over and over and over again. It doesn't work. That the only way we're going to fight what's happening in the culture is it requires the gospel and it requires to change people's hearts. You can fight these things and fight these things, but it's not going to stop because the heart is desperately wicked. They are abandoning God, turning away from God, and trying to force them to live according to Christian morality. It's never, ever going to ultimately work. Now, in doing that, I may have given the impression that I'm I'm not against abortion. And I, I hope that I did not do that. So let me offer a clarification. I believe abortion is wrong, right? I believe it is wrong. I believe it is murder. And I am 100% opposed to it. I just believe the only way, the, the first, and oh, let me state it this way. The first and most important way to fight against abortion is the gospel 
bringing the gospel to people, changing people's hearts so that they do begin to understand that life, there's sanctity to the human life, that life is sacred, that, that life comes from God, and that it's not, we should not be taking it and killing it and changing their worldview. But that's, that begins with a change of the heart. So I think that's the first and, 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 and most important way. I am not opposed, and make, I'm going to just make sure I offer a clarification here, to voting for people who would possibly try to stand against abortion because abortion is is murder. So because abortion is murder, then obviously we can take that extra step. Like there's some parts in the culture war, I don't want to try to force it upon lost people. But when it comes to abortion, we're trying to stop murder. So this one is in a different category. So I, I'm very much aware of that. I apologize for not making that clear. But I'm, I'm very much aware that abortion is murder. So I've got no problem voting that way, but l- let's just make this very clear. If the minds and hearts of the American people are increasingly beginning to, to uh, say that m- abortion is morally acceptable, you can vote and you can vote and you can vote and you can vote, but if the majority of people reject your way of voting, they'll just vote for people who will pass abortion laws allowing it for, for this for this reason and for this reason and for this reason they will they will try to fight against every abortion ban you vote for because if the if the if the majority of the people if you don't do something to change their hearts and their minds then you can vote, but it's a temporary victory until the next election and they vote those people out. Because if the people want the country to go in a certain direction, you can stand there and say, I'm going to vote against you. I'm going to vote against you. But the majority, that's how elections are won. (laughs) The majority will determine the direction of the country. So you've got to change the people so that they will then help change the country. Simply voting against the people is, I mean, it, it's like it's like walking up to a, a a dam that's holding back, you know, millions of tons of water and there's a crack in it and you're just trying to, you're going to put your finger and try to hold that, you know, the crack, keep it, you know, from bursting open. And sooner or later, all of that water, it, no matter, you're, you're not going to be able to stop it with your finger, with your hand. You're not going to be able to push against it. It's going to crack open and it's going to come flooding through. Well, we can, you can vote against vote and vote and vote and vote and vote and pass law and pass law and pass law. But ultimately, the people, if their hearts are not changed, they will rise up and cast off the restraint. They will break the chains asunder and rebel. And that's, that's where they will go. So I got no problem. Vote for all of the, you know, uh, pro-life candidates that you can. But if, if the gospel is not the, Thing that's changing people's heart. It's a temporary victory. It's temporary. And now that may be great, great, but it, it's not going to stop everything. What has happened? Christians have fought abortion politically. We've fought it through protest, through all those other things. And look what's happened. A record percentage of Americans consider abortion morally acceptable. It didn't change the hearts. We were trying to stop abortion without trying to change the heart. That's, that. That doesn't work because ultimately the people will then change the direction and ultimately overcome your vote because there'll be more of them than there will be of you unless evangelism is is a major focus. I, does I hope that makes sense. I hope that offers some clarification. Now, I would argue this. So what can we do about abortion? Here's what I would say. First, we've got to preach the gospel, call people to repentance and faith, bring them into the church and disciple them and teach them about the importance of human life, the sanctity of human life, and that life is sacred and that abortion is murder. Got no problem. That's part of discipleship. Let's do that. So let's focus on doing that first and foremost, all right? Number two, I think this is very important. And this one is very difficult. Now, this one is where I become frustrated because I'm sitting in a small church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and we have very little money. But churches have to do everything in their power to, and to let, you know, when a situation arises, here's a young woman, older woman, doesn't matter the age, she's pregnant, she doesn't want the child. The church has to step up to say either A, someone in the church was, is willing to adopt and take the child, like, hey, we'll, we'll take the child, 
if you if you if you won't abort it, we'll take care of it. We'll we'll do everything we can for it. We'll make sure it's got a good home. We'll make sure it's provided for. We'll do what we can. Now that requires a family. That requires a family that has the financial means. That may mean the church may have to financially help the family. Hey, that family will step up and say, hey, we will we will adopt this baby. We will take the baby, but we're going to need some financial help. And that's where the church says, we'll financially help support the child. We'll help, we'll help support the child. We'll we'll take care of it. That's that's that 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 takes churches that have money, right? It takes families that are willing to adopt. Uh, in some cases. Um, a woman will say, "I'm getting an abortion because I can't, I can't afford, uh, you know, the hospital bills." Well, that's where the church says, "We will, we will financially support you and pay all of the bills if you will c- take care of that baby, and then we'll help you financially. We'll help you get a job." The church has to do more. The church has to do more than just voting against abortion. You got to step up and do what you can. Now, I know you're limited. Like as a family, if you're listening, you may not have the ability to adopt. You may not be financially able to do so. You may not be physically able to do so. Your family may not be in a situation where you can, but then you step up with, can you give financially? Let's, we have, when it comes to this, we've got to step up and do what we can. Not just say, hey, abortion is bad. Great. But what can we do to help? What can we do to help? How can we uh, help those who, you know, a woman who finds herself pregnant and she doesn't feel like she has very many options? She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know, uh, you know, uh, okay, how am I going to support this? How am I going to pay for the medical coverage? There's got to be, now I know there are some Christian organizations out there that do this type of thing. That's where churches can help support those organizations if those organizations are, are shown to be, you know, doing the right thing with the money and not ripping people off, then, then by all means, we've got to do that. We've got to, look, we've got to look for every way to help support and preserve life that we can. Now, each church can do what they can do. Small church with no money, you're limited. But you know what? If you hear about the situation, then that church, that look, put it this way. Churches can't, like every church can do what it can do. Right, so let me try to state it this way: You may not be able to be a church where you can run out and say, "Hey, to every woman out there who's considering abortion, call us and we'll do what we can." But what you can pray is that if your church becomes aware of a situation, like here's a situation: someone in my church knows someone and they're considering abortion, and you know, and then then you bring that to the church, and the church says, "Okay, what can we do?" And the church has to be willing to pull together and say, "Okay, all right, guys, what's our options here?" Okay, all right, how much money can we give? What can we do? What, what can we, you know, can we, can we uh, pay for insurance for this person so that the, the, the uh, delivery and everything would be covered? It may be cheaper to, you know, buy them an insurance policy. I mean, you got to think outside the box. You got to be thinking and looking. So pray that God would bring situations to the light, to, to the knowledge of your particular congregation and that that congregation would be willing to do something about it. I think a lot of congregations spend a lot of money on a lot of stuff, but I don't see them putting a lot of money forward to do anything to try to help these situations. I mean, I've seen churches spend all kinds of money on a, basically a fellowship hall so the church can get together and put food in their mouth and have a place for fun, food, and games. Well, instead of building a fellowship hall, how about, I don't know, finding a way to help support uh, pregnant women who are considering abortion and doing what we can. I mean, it's one thing to tell the woman standing in front of abortion clinic, telling the woman, hey, you're going to kill your baby. Don't do that. All right. And then the woman is like, well, what am I supposed to do? Now, there are people who will stand in front of abortion clinics who will offer them all kinds of help. That's that's completely different. Instead of yelling at the woman that what you're going to do, what can we do? To, what can we do? Now, I don't have all the answers. But I'm saying we have to sometimes, we've got to present the gospel. By all means, if you want to vote, vote. But it's a a temporary thing. We've got to be, we got to do what we can. We got to do what we can. Okay, you want to, or I'm sorry, you're pregnant. Okay, you're thinking about abortion. All right, what what can can we do? What can we do? Right? Now, and, and, and the country that makes abortion legal, legally she has the right to do whatever she wants to do. But you can offer her saying, well, we're willing to do this and this and this. Is that an option? 
If she says no, she says no. There's nothing you can do about it. You can pray for her. You can pray for the situation. Obviously, you can present the gospel to her, um, and you can hope that you can do something. But you've got to step up uh, and do what you can. Now, I, I, again, not every family can. Right? There, there are families in your church that there's no way they could do that. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't. They couldn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't be a, a good situation. You don't want to bring the child into a, 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 a horrible situation. You obviously want to preserve the child's life and then put them in a great situation where they have a family who can support them emotionally, financially, and then the church has to do whatever they can to help in those situations. So I just want to make sure I, I clarify. I'm against abortion. I think first and foremost, it's the gospel you can vote, but that I'm telling you, if the, if the hearts and minds of the people aren't changed, it doesn't matter. You can vote all day. You're going to be one versus five other votes that are against you. So then your voting just becomes what? I mean, you, you're not accomplishing anything. You've got to change the hearts. And then uh, I guess the third major point I want to just clarify is, yeah, we've got to do something, but each church has to think about what can we do? And I think it's just constantly for asking all of your members of your church to just always have their eyes and ears open to what's going on around them and saying, what can, how can we intervene? It's one thing to have your eyes and ears open so that we can gossip about the person, so that we can supposedly pray for the person. No, have your eyes and ears. Oh, here's someone with a need. Okay, what can we do? What can we do? And I've always, at least in my church, now we haven't had any real situations dealing with abortion in our church, but we've definitely helped people any way we can financially. Any way we can financially, we try to help people with what we've paid people's rent. We, uh, we've, we've, we've paid people's electric bills. We've done whatever we can. Now, usually they're just complete strangers. We don't know anything about them, but if we can help, we try. Now, but we're limited. I mean, just yesterday, I mean, we're in a church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and I'm in the middle of preaching almost at the end of the sermon. Someone comes walking through the door. They walk in. As soon as the uh, sermon is over, they open up a, a little bag and they have all these bills inside, basically saying we need help paying all of these bills. There's no way we could pay all of the bills. No way. Now, I, I took a photograph of one of them. I'm going to be calling uh, the place today and, and trying to make sure that everything is legit. And we're going to try. We're going to try to pay their rent if we can. We're going to try. Um, I got to make sure it's all legitimate. Make sure it's all right. But I mean, we're a church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and you would be shocked how frequently someone will stop by here asking us for money or to pay a bill. Now. We always do everything. Now, we don't just hand them cash, but we will do everything we can to try to assist and try to help. Um, but we're limited in what we can do. That's just, that's just the thing it is. There's churches in big cities who you probably even get bombarded with a million other requests. The church has got to do what it can to help. Now, and I'm not saying, look, you're limited in what you can do, obviously. But what I'm saying is if you are in a situation where you can make an impact about abortion, then by all means, you know, if you've got the, if the church can set up a fund, right? Hey, so much money each month of the church budget is going to go into this fund to help uh, uh, with things related to abortion. And so you put an ad out, hey, if you're considering abortion uh, and you would like another option, you know, and, and you're, you know, you're a please contact us and we'll see what we can we can do for you and then you offer you know whatever services you can offer hey we'll we'll pay to have the baby delivered and then you know but, but just having the baby delivered then the, the can the woman support the baby maybe she wants to give it up to an adoption or if someone in the church can step up and adopt the baby these are tough questions i just know that it's easier it's always easy for the church to just condemn it speak against it, vote against it, and then we just carry on with our lives. I don't, ha- I don't have any easy answer. I, I do not have easy answers. Uh, there, it's hard. It requires money, requires sacrifice, requires a, a lot of work. But the bigger the church is, the more resources you have, what can you do with those resources to help in those situations? What organizations are uh, in your city that does things to try to help offer alternatives to people seeking an abortion? What all, uh, 
Call those uh, organizations. What alternatives do they offer? How much money given to those organizations go to what they're trying to do? How, how is that money managed? If you feel like it's an organization that is helpful and, and not harming anyone, but actually helping and trying to provide a loving, compassionate alternative to abortion, then by all means, see if your church will support it. You got to think, you got to think outside the box and we've got to put our, 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 our minds together. It's so many times um, it, it feels like I think a lot of people who support abortion, they sometimes feel like the church is quick to condemn it, condemn the women who get an abortion, heap all kinds of condemnation upon them and tell them, don't get an abortion, don't get an abortion. But they're never there to help with the situation. Now, you could argue, well, wait a minute. Why is it the church's responsibility? Uh, Doesn't individuals have a responsibility? Not denying individual responsibility. But our concern is about preserving that life. So what will we do? How far will we go? How far are we willing to sacrifice to help preserve life? It's, it, I mean, look, I wish I, wish I had a million dollars. I wish I had $5 million. If I had, if I had a million dollars, guess what? I'd put an ad in the local newspaper. If you're considering abortion, contact us and we will see uh, what we can do to help you, right? And then find out why are you considering abortion? Well, I can't, I can't afford it. I can't support the child. All right. Well, we can, we can pay to have, we can pay for everything so you can have the baby delivered. Okay. Well, what, um, I don't know if I can financially support the baby after. Okay. Well, after the baby is delivered, what if we as a church help support the baby with buying its needs, you know, and then seeing what we can do to help find you a job and see what we can do to help get you on your feet. Maybe we can help uh, get you, you know, maybe if, if, is, you know, do you need to go to a junior college, get a, a certificate or, or something so that you can get, a, a, have, you know, move forward and getting a job. You, you don't know what the situations are. You don't know what the situations are. You just have to pray that God will bring those situations to your church and then you'll be willing to do something about it. But I guarantee you in many churches, Man, they, they got no problem condemning it, but they, that church, the people in the church will not be supportive of, of putting a lot of money towards a lot of programs. They'll be like, nope, nope, nope. I've watched it even in a small church. I don't want to give money helping them. What? Well, then I'm sorry, you're in the wrong church because we're going to help people. Okay, we, we don't help people based on whether they deserve it. I, I, I never understand Christians thinking that, well, we're only going to help people who deserve it. Okay, that they don't deserve it. Well, I am praise God that he did not send Jesus only for the people who deserve it, right? The whole Christian message is God sent his son for people who did not deserve salvation, right? So we should be willing to try to help people who, and quote unquote, from a human perspective, maybe they don't deserve it. Maybe they got themselves into those situations. We do what we can. We're all limited. I understand. There's only so much money. That, that, that people have, and people have got to take care of their own families and take care of their own children, but it's something that we have to think about. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because of an email I received, and this, I, this is the reason I love getting emails, because it challenges me to clarify, but let me read a little bit of what they had to say, because I understand their struggle. I definitely understand their struggle, um, but let me read. I'm going to only read the part in, in, in regards to abortion, because there was a number, a number of things they talked about here. It says, and finally, on the podcast where more Americans are finding abortion morally acceptable, you've definitely opened my eyes with this episode combined with all the others that politicizing Christianity has failed and doesn't need to be our solution. I see it in my church and the churches around me more vividly in the past year than ever and ever, mostly thanks to your podcast. Clearly, with that, with what little power a single vote has, I'm sure I'll continue to vote for candidate. That's the closest to my values, as I would hope anyone would do that who would do that votes. But I'm not going to put my hope and faith in that candidate or in the political system. Completely understand that. By all means, vote uh, what you feel is closest to your values and doing what you can. Just understand that unless you change the hearts of the people, then the hearts of the people will ultimately rise up against what you're voting for because they don't hold your values. So we've got to give the people those values, and that comes from salvation. All right. Then this is this, and I'm so glad the person took the time to write this. And they and this got sent to me at 108 a.m. So I'm I'm so grateful that a person was up at that time thinking about you know a, a podcast that I had done. It says abortion is a touchy topic, though. 
on other issues, agreed, stop trying to legislate Christian morality. But with abortion, I struggle more to take that stance. I completely understand. Everyone knows it's murder. Yes, still pray, still teach the gospel. But goodness, if there's any solution that might, that might save some lives, do you not fight for that too? And I under, we definitely fight for that. I think, again, we have to look at what the church can do to help these women who are in these situations. What, what can we do? And it's very difficult because in some cases, you never, you never hear from the woman. You, never, you, don't, you may never come in contact with the woman. But if you can find, oh, you're considering abortion? Okay, well, what, okay, what can we do as a church? All right. but, but I completely agree. It is different. It, this is a little different than just legislating morality. This is about trying to save lives. I understand that. If you can push some legislation to force a 48-hour waiting period, and that 48-hour waiting period saves a life or two, is it worth using uh, politics to achieve that goal? I got no problem if you want to try to create a 48-hour waiting period and you try to vote for it. But let me just, again, state, if the majority of people don't like the 48-hour waiting period, you can fight for that all day. Even you may succeed and maybe you'll save a life and that's wonderful, but ultimately the people will just push back and get rid of the 48-hour waiting period. And even if you get a 48-hour waiting period and the woman has to wait 48 hours, in many cases, the reason the woman is seeking an abortion is she feels trapped and she doesn't feel like she has any options. Not in every case. Obviously, some people just do it for other reasons. But if there's a 48-hour waiting period, what is the solution for that woman at the end of those 48 hours? What can, you, what can we offer her? What can we do? What, can we, what, what are we willing to sacrifice in order to save a life? I think that's very important. Um, it says, uh, and please don't take this next statement as an attack. You know how much worth I put into your preaching. But if I take the stance that you've taken on what happens to the souls of aborted babies— all of them, it seems that would put an extra emphasis on Christians using every avenue possible to make abortion less available. All right. Now, and, and I understand what he's saying there. I, I don't, I, I can never say, um, and, and this is, I know, controversial. I cannot definitively say what happens to a baby when they pass away. I, I can't find in the Bible an age of, a, of accountability. I can't find in, uh, uh, in the Bible that, hey, you know what? Um, uh, if a, if a baby is aborted, it goes directly into heaven. So that would make abortion the greatest, you know, uh, device ever to send people to heaven. I, I cannot say that. I, it's, it, there's a lot of questions there I have. I have a lot of questions about what happens to a baby when it passes away. The early church, one of the reasons infant baptism was to try to give some comfort. Hey, if a baby dies and they're baptized, then, then they're okay. Um, there's been all kinds of, of people trying to create an age of accountability. There's all kinds of solutions people come up with. I'm not convinced that any of them are truly biblical. I don't know what happens. So yes, based off my teaching, I should be even more concerned with what happens. And I am very concerned uh, with what happens. I just know that all of our attempts won't ultimately stop the culture from moving in that direction. All right. And so I definitely understand that. Um, it says, uh, he goes, all of them, it seems, that put, would, uh, would put extra emphasis on Christians using every possible, uh, uh, every avenue possible to make abortion less available. Now, yes, you could ask me if I've adopted children, et cetera, and taken every possible action myself, and clearly I'd have to say no. I could definitely do more. I, admitted, I, I admittedly don't do a fraction of what I could or should. And I would never say that to anyone. I'll make it very clear. I, I want to make it very clear. That's... That's a debate technique. That's not a, uh, a discussion. What do I mean by debate technique? Well, hey, I mean, what do you want us to do about abortion? I mean, shouldn't we vote? Well, okay. Oh, you want to talk to me about voting? Well, have you adopted any children? That, that's, that's to win a, a, a debate. Um, Christians, we should not engage in trying to win debates. We have to have meaningful discussions. I would never say that. I think we have to discuss not what you're doing individually, but what because one individual, there's, there's only so many children you could adopt. There's only so many you could adopt. It's how the church as each individual congregation pulling all of our resources, what can we do? What, what, what organizations out there 
are, are built to try to help some of these situations. That's what we can look to do. And most importantly, though, is pray that you come in contact with a woman who's considering abortion and you have the ability to offer support, comfort, counseling, compassion, love, um, gospel, and, and you have the ability. The situation is in many cases, we never hear of it. We never hear it. There are w- women today who are going to be driving to an abortion clinic somewhere, and I don't know that they exist. I'm ne- I don't know who they are. I-, I don't have any contact with them. If I did, then then yeah, we have to do everything in our power. Sometimes we can only do what we can do. But I look, I'm not saying don't vote. By all means, vote. I'm just saying <laughs> at some point, if the people want it, the people are going to get it. And and you're not you you can only stop it for so long. Even if the, even if the Supreme Court was to to and and a lot of people are hoping that the Supreme Court is going to pass some you know or do some things that's going to help restrict abortion. Even if that works, you watch. Um, it, it, if you don't change the hearts of the people, it, it'll just lead to a backlash, and at some point it'll be right back overturned, and we'll be right back to where we are um, because. We've got to change hearts of people. We've got to change hearts of people. We have to. And I and I think, I think it it before I even like, but I'm not going to debate someone necessarily with the abortion issue. What I try to do is, we need to talk about salvation and the God. If I can, if I can bring them to Christ, you know. And when I say I bring them, obviously I believe uh, salvation is a sovereign work of God. If they are brought to salvation, then those views and ideas can slowly begin to change as they learn about life and, and the sanctity of life, and it begins to change. That's that's the ultimate hope. But yeah, I, I, I would never ch- say, well, what have you done? What have we all done? We, we all always have to ask ourselves, what have we done? We have enough of our own lives to take care of and problems and financial issues that we're dealing with. But you have to just ask yourself, what is your church doing? What is my church doing? Now, my church has helped people with bills. We've not really had a situation. Now, we did have a situation with a young child where uh, it wasn't good, and one of the families and the church uh, adopt, has adopted that child, and, that, and it was awesome to watch them d- d- do that. Um, that. That has occurred. So um, you, you can only you, – you, you got individuals in the church, and they can do what they can, but then the church has to be there to try to help where they can. And again – the smaller the church, the more limited you can do. I hate the fact that everything requires money, but a lot of this requires money. And a lot of people get abortion because they feel like they don't have any other option. He goes, but my overall point with that, you've influenced my viewpoint on the use of politics and Christianity, and you've convinced me it's not working. And abortion is the one area where I'm having a tough time letting go of my previous viewpoint. Don't let go of your previous viewpoint. Please don't let go of your previous viewpoint. I understand abortion is a horrible thing, and we want to stop it. I understand that. And by all means, vote. I understand. Vote uh, according to that. Don't go against your conscience. By all means, do that. I'm just saying that that will work until the majority of people don't no longer agree with your view on abortion. And then your voting will just mathematically won't matter because the majority is going to vote against your vote, and then you're never going to win an election again in regards to abortion. So then what's the solution? Well, then the solution is the gospel and churches doing everything we can to at least offer an alternative. Offer, uh, offer. hey, you, you want to get an abortion? Uh, we understand that. Can we ask you why? You know, can we, can, okay, financial reasons? It, or, or don't even ask them why, because it's, you know, it's not our, our, you know, our business. We can say, look, if you are getting an abortion because you feel like you cannot support the child, you don't have money to, for the hospital, you don't have money for these things, what can we do to help, help you to reconsider? We just want to give you the option. We just want to give you the option. Now, you got to be compassionate here. You don't want to come across like, you will do it our way. You can't be that way, but you can offer every hope and help that you can and see if that makes a difference in that situation. Some situations are going to look at you and go, I don't care what you think. I'm getting an abortion because I don't want the kid and I don't want to have to deal with it. And sadly, that's a hard issue and not going to, not going to change it. Now you can, 
You could uh, stand in front of abortion clinics and offer counseling. Now, I know some people are there protesting. I think some there are to offer, some people are in front of abortion clinics, I think in a more compassionate way to say, look, I'm not here to yell at you or condemn you. Just want you to know that if you decide not to get an abortion, we're here and here's the services we can offer. That's what we need. We need that more than anything. But the gospel is the key. And they go on to say this. Uh, But my overall point, I'm going to back up my overall point with that. You've influenced my viewpoint on the use of politics and Christianity, and you convince me it's not working. And abortion is the one area where I'm having a tough time letting go of my previous viewpoint. It almost feels like praying for the hungry and doing nothing to help feed the hungry if we don't take actions, if we don't take the actions we can. I haven't researched the early days of when abortion was first legalized, but I've often heard how silent the church was then and can't help but wonder if things had been different if the church had spoken up more. Now, you may have a very good point there. The, um, the church may could have, spo- could have spoken up more. I, will, I think I will argue that in many cases, the church... And I could be wrong here, but let me just offer at least this idea. And what I witnessed when I was young and all of the yelling and screaming about abortion is Christians seem to be more in the condemning of it, speaking against it, protesting it, but it didn't that that it almost viewed that Christians were just mean and cruel and condemned women who found themselves in a difficult situation. And I don't know if we ever were very good at at balancing it out with compassion and love and help and actual tangible support. Um, And I know it's hard to find that balance. It is, because on one hand, you've got to speak against an evil that is found in the culture. You have to speak against the evil in the culture because you've got to tell everyone that it's it's evil. But you've you've heard uh, horrible situations where Christians have been accused of not being very helpful in these situations. So I would say this. I don't know I don't know what the church could have done earlier on as far as the church could have approached it as look, here's the thing, if you want to get an abortion um and it's now legal, we're not going to scream and yell at you to stop that, but what we will say is we will, we're here to offer an option. And here are the options we can offer. Financial support. Maybe we can try to help uh, uh, someone uh, uh, adopt the baby and take the baby from you so that it can be raised in a good family. We can offer this. Maybe we could have done more in offering solutions. um, But immediately it was more, obviously it was probably more along the condemning lines. And then you could argue, how about the politics? I, I just feel like my whole Christian life I, I feel like I don't I can't ever think of a time in my Christian life where every election it was like we've got to vote against abortion. We got to vote against abor- abortion. I think I've heard that my whole Christian life and always on Christian radio. We got to vote against abortion. We got to vote against abortion. We got to I've heard that forever. And I've heard all the you know, we got to vote. We got to vote. We got to vote. And abortion is still going on. So all the voting never stopped it. Now, you could argue that in certain states they were able to either restrict it, delay it, put, you know, do some things. And so maybe, maybe in, in, in state elections, it had more impact, but in federal elections, abortion has just continued on and on and on and on and on and on. And no matter how much money Christians spent in trying to help political parties and voting, it, it never stopped it. So I agree with this individual 1000% that it's, that abortion is something very different than maybe other cultural issues because you're dealing with the loss of human life. Very much agree. I wish we had better solutions, but I, I don't, I don't know if we ever will come up with them. Um, no. Uh, so, so Will just contacted me. He goes, thank you. You're very helpful. Sorry if I caused you to make a special trip. No, 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 no. Never, 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 never apologize for causing me to make a special trip because this is the whole, this is what I like. See, he brought up, and I don't want, I want everyone to hear what I'm about to say. The, the email the, is the, I see the podcast as I start the conversation. If people don't respond, then the conversation 
doesn't come full circle. For the conversation to happen, I speak and then you respond. And then your response then brings me back to the microphone. That's how we encourage and exhort one another. That's how that encouraging exhorting. He brought up issues that I I didn't even mention in my podcast. So he helped, clar- helped me, force me to clarify it. That's what we needed to do. We have to talk about it. We have to have these tough conversations with one another because it is tough uh, to know what to do. I, I, you know, I, I, I literally can't stand abortion. I hate the idea uh, of, of children just being killed and I, feeling so hopeless and helpless. I, 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 I am. I, I wish and pray that God would intervene in a supernatural way, but we've, uh, so far he has not. And I wish that, um, I wish our, I wish, most importantly, I wish people would just open their eyes to understand what it is and that people's hearts would be changed because all of the voting has never stopped it. All the boycotts and protests have never stopped it. I mean, I mean, I've seen some of those protests in front of abortion clinics. I mean, for crying out loud, there was, you know, there was, there was at least, there's even been violence carried out against abortion doctors and abortion clinics. And that didn't, I mean, all of every crazy thing that people have tried, it, it just, it's led to the point where we are now that the majority of Americans think it's morally acceptable. Now, it is still true that most Americans still support some kind of a restriction. Like they may believe abortion is morally acceptable, but they usually believe it's morally acceptable only for the very first part of the pregnancy. But after a certain uh, trimester, they, they usually step in and go, no, 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 no. That's too far. So there's still some hope that that there's something to build on there. But it, unless we change the hearts, it's just it's it's just a never ending horrific cycle of, of, of murder. And, and there's no way to get around that. And I, and I feel, look for, and I've got, I have to say this for any women listening who had, who, who had an abortion. Let me just make this very clear. There is forgiveness at the cross. There is complete forgiveness. You bring that sin to Christ. He forgives it and washes it completely away. And I don't want to heap any further condemnation upon you. There is forgiveness. The the grace of God is greater than your sin. It's greater than my sin. There is hope. There is comfort. There is forgiveness. You cannot change what happened. You cannot go back, but you can be forgiven and turn to Christ and he will forgive you. I I don't want any woman to, to be living. If you're a woman who's a Christian, you've turned to Christ, but you still live with that guilt. I don't want to add any more guilt to that. You cling to the cross. There is complete forgiveness. That sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. It's been completely, it's completely forgiven. David had a man murdered. He was forgiven. Paul was responsible for people being murdered before he became a Christian. There, there, there's forgiveness. If you were a Christian and you found yourself in a horrible situation and you had an abortion, there's still forgiveness. So we can never forget that part of the message when talking about abortion. There is forgiveness. Um, I know many women get very upset when Christians speak against it because they, they believe that we don't ever show any compassion or concern. It's very hard to find the balance. Look, it's, it's hard to find the balance in our message. It's hard to find the balance in, our, in what actions we take. It's hard to find the balance in, in you know, what we can support, what we can't support. It's it's always hard to find that, and it's it's a struggle. It's a struggle, and I, I'm grateful for the conversation. So thank you for for emailing me because I, I, as soon as I read the email, I was like, wow, that's those are some great points, and I didn't make that clear enough. And so thank you for forcing me to clarify it. And just just all we can do is again gospel, pray, and do everything we can in our power, and look in your local area for organizations that are, and see what they're doing. What are they doing to offer support to women who want an abortion? What are they offering? What what medical care are they offering? What financial support are they offering? And then check those organizations, find out that they're legit and that the money really goes to that and then see if your church can support it. Not just you, the church, because one individual can only support it so much financially, but when the church pulls their resources, they can always do so much more. 
Like one person may only give, can give $5. Another person can give a hundred. Well, when two people come together, well, there's 105. Okay. So that, that's, it's still more than what one person could have given. So that $5 goes a long way when, when, when put with other, um, other monies to, to help that. So I, I just know that if I ever end up in a situation where we can hopefully preserve and save a life, I hope my church would, we would do everything in our power to sacrifice whatever we needed to, to try to save a life. Now we can't put out a notice as, as a small church saying, Hey, anyone out there contact us? Cause we could, we, we would be very limited in what we can do. I mean, you know, we, we rarely even have money in our bank account. So, uh, you know, we, we're just paying our bills. So, uh, so we're limited, but that's still no excuse. We still have to do whatever we can uh, with whatever we can. Like, you know, I'm going to try to tr- pay someone's rent today here in a little bit. Um, I, hopefully, hopefully uh, we can. Hopefully it's a legitimate situation and we can help the individual, hopefully. So um, hopefully we, we would do the same thing with, with anything. It's, it's a tough situation. I wish I had better answers. I really wish I had better answers, but I do not. But it's a subject that we may return to soon. So thank you so much, Will. Thank you so very, very, very much for the email. Very challenging, very thoughtful. And I definitely hear in your voice, that, in, your, in your email, I can hear that, that concern. And I, man, I'm, it bothers me every day. It bothers me every day. I worked in the medical world for 22 years. And there are lots of, we had lots of situations uh, in regards to abortion and, and, and discussions and conversations. And yeah, and it's horrible, horrible uh, when you, you know, get a phone call and, and someone is seeking to get an abortion, you know, it, what, what, uh, you know, what do I do? What do I do? Now, the good thing is in, in most, in most of the military situations I have, we did not perform abortions. Um, so that was good because I didn't know what I was going to do. I, from a Christian perspective, I worked in the, at one point I was in, in charge of the admissions office. Would I, if a person came in to get an abortion and I was, would I admit them? Would I do the admission? Well, would that be wrong? What, what do I do there? Like I was put in, I, I, there was a lot of situations. I didn't know what I was going to do, uh, but you would, you know, you would hear about situations and you just want to say, you know, please, you know, you, what, what, what am I allowed to do here at work? You know, what can I do? Are, are you, you know, can, can I, what can I do for you? <laughs> you know, like, you know, do you understand what I'm, how can I help you? You know, so, uh, those are, those are horrible, uh, situations. And, uh, I just wish, I wish it would go away. I think we're, I think we're so far in the darkness now as a culture and the cult, and I know it, it's a, it's almost a cliche now, but the culture of death is so upon us that I, I know that a lot of people were hopeful that I know a lot of people are hopeful that the Supreme Court that we currently have is going to overturn Roe v. Wade and it's it's all going to go away. We'll see. We'll see. If that happens, then then everyone who uh, argued for Trump will will prove to be proven to be right because Trump will be would be instrumental in uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned if the Supreme Court does that. If this Supreme Court doesn't take any major steps to overturn Roe v. Wade, and they don't really do much to to bring to stop abortion, then I think you can just realize it's never going to happen. I mean, if this Supreme Court doesn't do it, I cannot ever see a time in the future where we'll it will ever get a better chance. This is like the best chance I think I've had in, in our lifetime with the Supreme Court that we currently have. And if it doesn't change, then I don't think I think it's over. I think it's done, and and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do, uh, look at it other way other ways. As far as I know, from a historical fact, I'll end with this. And I don't know if this is to be 100% historically accurate. So by all means, check it. I understand that in Rome, at times, it was a practice that if a baby was not wanted, or it was, there was something wrong with the baby, or for whatever reason, the baby was deemed not worthy to live, they would just leave the baby like on a hillside or anywhere to be eaten by wild animals or to be killed. And from my understanding, I don't know how widespread the practice was, don't know how common it was, because a lot of these stories then, you know, become exaggerated. But my understanding that it was somewhat common for Christians to go out and then pick up those babies to take care of them and to raise them as their own, uh, that they would basically take the, the children. 
Now, that's a that's a far different situation because adoption is very difficult in many cases, lots of red tape. Um, but that that is the way many Christians handled that practice was they just took the baby and raised it as their own. Um, I know in, in our culture, it's not that simple, but it just demonstrates that many Christians resolved a lot of those issues. They didn't look to the government to help them. Uh, they looked to what they could do. Okay, God, what can I do? Provide me the situation. Put me in the situation where I can make a difference. And then we, we, we look to act where we can. So, I, you know, I don't, that's not the best answer, but it's the best I can come up with. So thanks for the discussion. Other people may have other thoughts and comments. Please let me know. You can email me at newsif at yahoo.com. I always appreciate this ability to have this conversation and these discussions. It's, it's, it's that back and forth. That's how we, we become stronger. We become, it's iron sharpeneth iron. That's, that's what we need. We need discussions, not debates, discussions. Uh, debates, you start falling into debate techniques where you play these little tricks and gotchas and that, no, we need uh, discussions and, and struggling with this. And yeah, from my doctrinal perspective, since I don't know what happens to a baby when it passes away, I don't think I can offer a, a clear biblical answer. Yeah, it, 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 it makes it even more concerning to me. Um, it, it makes me concern every day. I don't remember the number. I'd have to look up the number. How many people die every day in the world from starvation? How many people die every day because they don't have a clean drinking water? Every day on, uh, when I'm driving home on talk radio, they have a, a public service announcement about how many children die every day because of lack of clean drinking water. And it's like absolutely staggering how many people die every day from hunger, from a lack of a clean drinking water, from medical, from diseases that there are cures to, but they don't have access to medical care in other countries. How many people die every day from so many things? And it's like, what are we doing to stop any of it? And then you add abortion to it, it can become very depressing and very discouraging. All right. Thank you for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.